Chapter Two of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Two. Before the summer was ended, however, a new twist of his life and affairs started the mechanism of the professor's imagination again. It was announced to him when he returned from summer school on a hot afternoon. He dropped his portfolio on the parlor desk, one corner of which still showed the claw marks of the miscreant Samson, and sat down with a comfortable sigh. Abednego? His wife seldom addressed him by his first name. Yes? I... I, I want to tell you something. Yes. Haven't you noticed any difference in me lately? He had never noticed a difference in his wife. When they reached old age, he would still be unable to discern it. He shook his head and looked at her with some apprehension. She was troubled. What's the matter? I suppose you wouldn't yet, she said, but, well, I'm with child. The professor folded his upper lip between his thumb and forefinger. With child? Pregnant? You mean, I'm going to have a baby. Soon after their marriage, the timid notion of parenthood had escaped them. They had, in fact, avoided its mechanics, except on those rare evenings when tranquility and the reproductive urge conspired to imbue him with courage and her with sinfulness. Nothing came of that infrequent union. They never expected anything. And now they were faced with it. He murmured, A baby. Faint annoyance moved her. Yes, that's what one has. What are we going to do? I don't know, Matilda, but I'm glad. She softened. So am I, Abednego. Then a hissing, spattering sound issued from the kitchen. The beans, Mrs. Danner said. The second idol of their lives was finished. Alone in his bed, Tossing on the hot, humid muslin sheets, Danner struggled within himself. The hour that was at hand would be short. The logical step after the tadpoles and the kitten was to vaccinate the human mammal with his serum, to produce a superchild, an invulnerable man. As a scientist, he was passionately intrigued by the idea. As a husband, he was dubious. As a member of society, he was terrified. That his wife would submit to the plan or to the step it necessitated was beyond belief. She would never allow a sticky tube of foreign animal matter to be poured into her veins. She would not permit the will of God to be altered or her offspring to be the subject of experiment. Another man would have laughed at the notion of persuading her. Mr. Danner never laughed at matters that involved his wife. There was another danger. If the child was female and became a woman like his wife, then the effect of such strength would be awful indeed. He envisioned a militant reformer, an iron-bound Calvinist, remodeling the world single-handed, a Scotch Lilith, a matronly Gabrielle, a she Hercules. He shuddered. A hundred times he denied his science. A hundred and one times it begged him to be served. Each decision to drop the idea was followed by an effort to discover means to inoculate her without her knowledge. To his wakeful ears came the reverberation of her snores. He rose and paced the floor. A scheme came to him. After that, he was lost. Mrs. Danner was surprised when her husband brought a bottle of blackberry cordial to her. It was his first gift to her in more than a year. She was fond of cordial. He was not. She took a glass after supper, and then a second, which she drank for him. He smiled nervously and urged her to drink it. His hands clenched and unclenched. When she finished the second glass, he watched her constantly. I feel sleepy, she said. You're tired, he tried to dissemble the eagerness in his voice. Why don't you lie down? Strange, she said a moment later. I'm not usually so, so misty. He nodded. The opiate in the cordial was working. She lay on the couch. She slept. The professor hastened to his laboratory. An hour later he emerged with a hypodermic syringe in his hand. His wife lay limply, one hand touching the floor. 
Her stern, dark face was relaxed. He sat beside her. His conscience raged. He hated the duplicity his task required. His eyes lingered on the swollen abdomen. It was cryptic, enigmatic, filled with portent. He jabbed the needle. She did not stir. After that, he substituted a partly empty bottle of cordial for the drugged liquor. It was perhaps the most practical thing he had ever done in his life. Mrs. Danner could not explain herself on the following morning. She belabored him. Why didn't you wake me and make me go to bed? Sleeping in my clothes. I never did such a thing in my life. I couldn't wake you. I tried. Rubbish. You were sleeping so hard you refused to move. Sometimes, old as you are, I'd like to thrash you. Danner went to the college. There was nothing more to do. Nothing more to require his concentration. He could wait as he had waited before. He trembled occasionally with the hope that his child would be a boy, a sane, healthy boy. Then, in the end, his work might bear fruit. The Euglena Viridis, he said in flat tones, will be the subject of tomorrow's study. I want you gentlemen to diagram the structure of the Euglena Viridis and write five hundred words on its vital principles and processes. It is particularly interesting because it shares properties that are animal with properties that are vegetable. September, October, November. Chilly winds from the high mountains, the day-by-day -day freezing over of ponds and brooks, smoke at the tops of chimneys, snow, Thanksgiving, and always Mrs. Danner growing with the burden of her offspring. Mr. Danner sitting silent, watching, wondering, waiting. It would soon be time. On Christmas morning there entered into Mrs. Danner's vitals a pain that was indefinable and at the same time certain. It thrust all thought from her mind. Then it diminished, and she summoned her husband. Get the doctor. It's coming. Danner tottered into the street and executed his errand. The doctor smiled cheerfully. Just beginning? I'll be over this afternoon. But, good Lord, you can't leave her like... Nonsense. He came home and found his wife dusting. He shook his head. Get Mrs. Nolan, she said. Then she threw herself on the bed again. Mrs. Nolan, the nearest neighbor, wife of Professor Nolan and mother of four children, was delighted. This particular Christmas was going to be a day of some excitement. She prepared hot water and bustled with unessential occupation. Danner sat prostrate in the parlor. He had done it. He had done more. And that would be known later. Perhaps it would fail. He hoped it would fail. He wrung his hands. The concept of another person in his house had not yet occurred to him. Birth was his wife's sickness until it was over. The doctor arrived after Danner had made his third trip. Mrs. Nolan prepared lunch. I love to cook in other people's kitchens, she said. He wanted to strike her. Curious, he thought. At three thirty, the industry of the doctor and Mrs. Nolan increased, and the silence of the two, paradoxically, increased with it. Then the early twilight fell. Mrs. Danner lay with her lank black hair plastered to her brow. She did not moan. Pain twisted and convulsed her. Downstairs Danner sat and sweated. A cry, his wife's. Another, unfamiliar. Scurrying feet on the bare parts of the floor. He looked up. Mrs. Nolan leaned over the stairwell. It's a boy, Mr. Danner, a beautiful boy and husky. You never saw such a husky baby. It ought to be he said. They found him later in the backyard, prancing on the snow with weird ungainly steps. A vacant smile lighted his features. They didn't blame him. End of chapter 2